The impact that Yodam Adelenki has had on our cooking in this country is honestly astounding. Through his award-winning and best-selling cookbooks, Jerusalem, Sweet, Adelenki, Plenty, and Nopi, he has expanded our food vocabulary to the point that, I mean, every one of you must have sumac or harissa as a pantry staple, and it's because of this man. He's done it. And I have to be honest with you, while I own all the other cookbooks, like maybe some of you, I'm a busy woman, and I don't have very much patience. I host almost 600 authors a year. So I pour over these cookbooks, and I've read them, but mainly for inspiration rather than a literal meal. But this one, Adelenki Simple, I've already cooked out of. The pavardelli with rose harissa, black olives and capers. Just trust me, trust me. I think Adelenki Simple represents a real step forward in the Adelenki Library. It shows a chef and a visionary a complete ease with himself and his abiding vision. Rich, contrasting flavors, freshness, an element of surprise, inclusion. Perhaps this new cookbook is a natural outgrowth of being a successful businessman and restaurateur, a husband, and a father of two young children. There's a maturity and a confidence in these meals, an unfussiness and purity that are a distillation of everything we all love and admire about his cooking. These 30-minute meals don't draw attention to themselves. They're part of a tapestry of a bigger life. They're about cooking something wonderful for ourselves and the people we love in busy times so that we can focus on just a moment of calm and being together. Yodam will be in conversation tonight with one of my favorite people, Sally Swift. Sally is a co-creator and managing producer of The Splendid Table. The Splendid Table's radio program, podcast, and website have been in the vanguard of the movement for food quality and consciousness for two decades, and she's just, she's the best. Please help me welcome Sally Swift and Yodam Analenki again to Sixth and I. <laughs> I know, right? I'll be safe. It's always hard to follow up after Liz introduces you. Anyway, welcome to Washington, D.C. Thank you. you. It's great to be all here. All of these people, they're all here to see you. I know, and it's the, I think it's the third, my third time here in this room, and it's, it's incredible. It's it is great to be place. here. Um, I want to take off a little bit on something that Liz brought up with all of these ingredients, because I just want to take a list. I'm, you know, I don't know, how many people here have cooked out of one of Yotam's books. Just don't care. Okay, yay. That is pretty impressive. So this is what I need in my pantry when I cook out of one of your books. Black garlic, sumac, harissa, rose harissa, tahini barberries, fenugreek, urfa chili, cardamom, sumac. How did you write a simple book? <laughs> How did this happen, this, second, this, last, this latest uh, I'll book? I'll tell you, I think... Um it's, it's quite difficult for me to explain the... Um, other people do better explaining of what I go through. I just, I just do it. But um, the, the, what <laughs> app happened, the official version, is that... Um, we don't want official. Yeah, well, the, the, that's the only one I can give you. Um, <laughs> a few years ago, The Guardian asked me to do a supplement for the, um, for the s spring, I think. It was with 12 or 20 simple ingredients, simple recipes. And I remember sitting around, sitting with um, my co-authors on the book, are Tara and Esme, who um, work in my test kitchen. And we said, um, and I was just like banging my head against the wall, and I was saying, I mean, Ottolenghi is not simple. I mean, what are they talking about? And um, and but we took the challenge, and we sat down, and we thought, okay, so what do we do? And what happened was it, it, the most incredible conversation. Like people, both uh, Tara and Esme and myself came up with all of these little tricks of what we do at home. So what kind of cans we bring out of the of the of the cupboard, and um, and what, what what kind of shortcuts we take, mm -hmm. and what are the quick and easy recipes that we do? What do we do with pasta? What do we do with rice? What do we do with potatoes? And all of a sudden, the 20 recipes were just there written, have written themselves almost. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then I've done more of those. And, and the more I did, the more I realized that actually this kind of limitation was actually really uh, liberating in some sense. Because all of a sudden, within the parameters of what we were, we were given, we, were, we could really create and do new things. And, and those 
supplements have turned into this book, essentially, with some more extra recipes that we developed. But the reason why this book came to be is because of my sister, because my sister, that's the... This is the, the official story? The non-official story. Uh, <laughs> was that my sister always said to me, like, I'm too busy to cook your recipes, really. Uh, she said, um, I don't have two days to do the shopping, two days to do the shoe cooking, and two days to do the washing up. And, um, <laughs> and I said to her, but you know, it's really worth it at the end. She said, I'm a working mother, I've got a lot on, on my plate, and, um, and I'm just not, it's not going to happen. So with the, with the moment that book was in the making, I called my sister and said, you've got no excuses anymore, this is coming out. <laughs> And she recently received her autographed copy. And has she cooked from it? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. You have to see what she, what she picks out of those recipes. Because yeah. your recipes are so elegant. And the way you choose to describe them in the title, how do you go about deciding what you're going to call something? Because I don't know if you, lots of people understand what you do when you develop a recipe. But I think you should talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, so um, the recipe development is really, is a way, it can, can, can happen in all sorts of interesting mm -hmm. ways. Uh, sometimes, so I, I, I used to develop all of the recipes myself, but this was just until plenty. And after that, I realized that I just cannot do it by myself. I'm, run out, I'm running out of ideas and I'm bored with my own company. And, um, and so the, the way it's done now is I've got a little creative team of two or three people that we constantly work in my test kitchen, which is under a railway arch in Camden in North London. And essentially what we do is we play with food, but every um, testing session begins with a conversation. Actually, we have a conversation about once a week mm -hmm. about what we're going to cook and what we're going to taste. And these are the, mo the best conversations because essentially once you've decided what you're going to cook, you more or less stick to it. Of course, there's variation along but the like way. But like what? So you say we're going to do a pasta or we're going to do a so we do, scalloped so potato? Or it could be anything. It could be a pasta column. It could be a potato column. But it could be also a three-course meal for the new year when you want to eat yep. light. You know, there's all sorts of... The, per the, 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 the reason for the, for the recipe doesn't really matter. It really, it's much more about the actual conversation, about the, the recipe. So if we do three potato salads, yes, it could happen that we do that. But then um, someone would say, why don't we do something which is like, um, like um, very Asian. So we use kaffir lime and chili and, and lots of garlic and ginger. And then so, so if, that is, if that is the case, maybe we should all add some, um, you know, uh, dried shrimps or fish sauce. So it's a very associative and, and mm -hmm. ideas just come up. But these are great conversations. And what follows is a series of experiments where we put all these things to the test. And then we all get around the plate and taste. And I'm sure you do that also mm -hmm. all the time. And people, you know, say what they think. And it's just like the best thing you can, mm -hmm. you can do. It's, it's delicious and it's fun. And how do you go about naming it? The names come out, I don't know, I mean, if we put names and then when I send them to whoever's going to publish them, whether it's newspaper or a book, or for a book, I, th I think uh, the name should be informative on the one hand, so you want to know what you're going to cook, but it, you don't want a shopping list, you know, you don't want every single ingredient, so you want to draw people's attention, but also make sure that they are intrigued enough and not get all the answers at the same time. I can't really explain how I give a but name. But you have really sexy recipe titles, <laughs> don't you think? I think they are incredibly, what did I write? I wrote a couple down. I mean, they're beautiful. They could be paintings. They're so descriptive. Thank you. Well, yeah, I guess. I mean, the, 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 the thing is that I really want to convey something in the title, and sometimes it's, it, it, certain recipes are easier to name than, than others. Right. The, the Bridget Jones uh, <laughs> salmon is, was very easy to name because it had a great story, and you needed to include the story in the title. Because Should I tell the story? Please. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the Bridget Jones uh, famous series of film you probably heard of, and the one of them, the, the, the latest one, just came out in the, cinem, in the cinemas about a couple of years ago. And someone called me and they said, oh, did you have, do you have product placement in the new Bridget Jones film? And I said, no, we don't. We don't even do product placement. So as uh, she said, but, you know, um, her boyfriend brings her a bag from Ottolenghi and there's a salmon in it with capers and saffron, oh, no, with uh, currants and saffron and celery. And I said... Well, that's interesting. So I went and watched the film, and he, 
And, uh, and he does that. Yeah, he brings her a bag from Otolenghi to win her over. And, um, but we'd never had that salad on the menu. <laughs> And now you do. So uh, we had to go back and reinvent the dish <laughs> after I watched the film. So that had to be the title of the recipe. I mean, there's no other way. We, 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 we couldn't think of a better name, really. We tried hard. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty good. Um, I want to talk about cooking for weeknights because it's an incredibly stressful thing for people. And I'm actually of the mind that sometimes it's easier to cook for a dinner party than it is to cook when you come home at 7 o'clock at night and you need to figure out what to do. The one thing that I think is, uh, for me, is very typical of a weeknight and, um, is that I kind of think, even I do, I, I produce recipes for a living, so I should be the one who doesn't have that problem, but I'm stuck in a rut. Like, I go and I go like, what am I going to do tonight? And you literally are lost for mm -hmm. ideas. And, um, and I don't know what it's like. I mean, there's a race. We are quite imaginative. But was, when we find ourselves in the kitchen at the end of the day, we just don't have ideas. I don't know why, what, 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 what makes us this way. So I don't have solutions. But the one thing that I do a lot, and that's not very sexy, but it's just like I do a lot of bulk cooking on the weekend. And mm -hmm. this, re this recipe book, often there is... Um, ideas about what you, sauces and, and basic um, dressings that you can actually make in bulk and fr refrigerate or put in the freezer, and they're, they're good for the week. There's a recipe, for instance, in the book for, um, ch it's called chili fish, and uh, essentially it's a tomato-based, tomato and chili-based sauce in which you just poached a, a cod or a halibut or a white fish that you want, and then you drizzle it with tahini sauce and sprinkle with cilantro. And that's, the, the, the sauce is so basic and delicious. It's got some ancho chili and some tomato paste and tomatoes and fresh chili. But in actual fact, it's something that you can really make, like quadruple the recipe and do all sorts of things with. So I love all these things. And they always sit in the freezer and they're ready and they're not even that, you know, they're not really complicated, but this is the beginning of something. So that's, right. this can turn into anything really, that right. tomato and chili based sauce. And it's about practice. Do you think that, that cooking is a little bit about practice? I think it's all about practice. Yeah. Um, so I have um, I have a podcast it's called, uh, that I've, I've actually just started doing it for, for the book because I wanted to expand a little bit on the ideas of the book through conversation. Mm -hmm. And you know all about podcasts, but I didn't know anything about podcasts. And um, in, in the conversations, I invite people to my house and I cook for them. And... Um, and try to get them to uh, to talk about things that, for me, you know, for them means a little bit of putting them at ease, whatever it is that challenges them, how they kind of relax, how they don't stress about things. So I had um, in my, one of my first guests was uh, Nigella Lawson. She's a famous English oh, cookery what a writer. ringer. I mean, come you know, on. The, you know her. You know Nigella, <laughs> right? So she came to my house and, and she cooked to me. And she said something very clever. She said, uh, you know, to have, um, is everything all right? Ah, someone okay, lost a cup. Okay, good. <laughs> we got it. <laughs> that was dramatic. <laughs> um, okay, so Nigella's in your house. So Ni Nigella said, we were, try we were talking about how, what it is you do to make yourself at ease in the kitchen. And she said, one of the words that people don't really mention much, but is really important, is competence. And um, it's not a sexy word. I mean, mm -hmm. it's sexy when she says it, but otherwise it's not sexy. <laughs> and, um, and, um, and it's, but it's about the power of repetition. Yeah. And with cooking, I think this is really something we tend to forget because we want to reinvent ourselves as chefs every night of the week or every time we entertain people. And it's one of the most, it's a conundrum because it's a real bad idea. To, to reinvent yourself as a chef yeah. five minutes before people are coming for right. dinner. Right, right, right. And, uh, but that's what many people try to do is to really think, you know, oh, I've got to cook something that I've never cooked before. But really, if you're going to cook something that you've never cooked before, you're going to quite likely fail or be super stressed. And if you cook something you cooked a hundred times, you're so at ease. So what would you rather have? A host that is fretting exactly. right. and produced something mildly okay or you want someone who produced something 
fantastic that you had a few times in their house, but who cares? You know, it's, right. it's, I, I really think there is something very, very important in that, in that understanding that you really don't need to challenge yourself every time you go into the kitchen. Right. And there's a canon of work that can give you freedom if you know how to do a certain handful of things. You know, I always talk about having five recipes that you really know really well that you know you can pull off and love. Absolutely. And then you go from there. Um, what do you think people need to know to become good cooks? Do you have... I think people need to know what makes them... It, it goes back to the same point that I said. You need to know what makes you... Um, what, where, where is your confidence and what you feel confident about. Um, so when we were working on this book, on Simple, uh, we tried to break down the recipes according to the words... The, um, I think the right word is an acronym. Acronym. But people have debated, maybe it's not an acronym, it might be something else. But anyway, we'll we... We'll be corrected. We'll, <laughs> um, mnemonic. I think mnemonic is the word. Okay. But maybe not. But anyway, the S-I-M-P-L-E are short for different ways of cook. We broke down the recipe. So S would stand for short on time. So recipes that take less than half an hour to cook. I stands for ingredients, 10 or less. Which must have been hard for you. Which was really hard for me because <laughs> less than 25 and I don't know <laughs> what I'm doing. Um, and the M is make ahead. So this is really, that's a very important category because that's the one we were talking about. I mentioned to you. is your freedom. Is the pre prepare. So it's something, you could just get everything done before people arrive. And then it's just all about warming up or putting together. The P is for pantry, so those are recipes that you cook from your pantry, rice, pasta, couscous. L is lazy. Um, and the lazy is really, it's, it's about recipes that, it's about like roasts and stews. It's things that you start and then essentially they kind of cook themselves. And the E is the easier than you think. And those are recipes that um, are, it's a bit, it's a, again, it's about the psychology of the cook more, mm -hmm. than, more than the actual recipe. Uh, things that you feel intimidating, like a, an ice cream or bread or something that has mm -hmm. a fancy French name, but actually they're much less difficult or like what? Like, like an ice cream. So there's a recipe there for for a really delicious raspberry ice cream that doesn't need an ice cream machine, and you can put it together in a very short time. Uh, or a, or beetroot bread again that you mix it all in a bowl and throw it in a thing in in a, in a tin and and bake. Um, so these five categories, every recipe in the book would be easy in at least one of those six ways, but most of them would be in more than one way. And the way we broke down the recipes is really to kind of let people uh, figure out what kind of simple cook they are, whether they're, they're a make-ahead kind of person, whether they are um, right. an eye kind of person, the ingredient kind of person. So every recipe has a few icons above it saying, you know, are you an M person? If you're an M person, you can cook me. It's good. It's a great system, actually. Yeah. No, it, it works because, again, it's like, for me, there's no such thing as an easy recipe per se. You know, what's easy for me is not necessarily easy for you. But once you figure out, then you can What your style it. is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you have six restaurants now? Is that yeah. You have six restaurants. You write a column for The Guardian. You now are a podcaster. Um, what's your day like? Like, what do you do when you get up in the morning? Where do you go? <laughs> <laughs> um, after we, I have two young children, so after we drop them at nursery and at school, um, I normally go to my test kitchen. So I skip breakfast because I know I'm going to start eating around 11 o'clock in the morning. So it's the best policy not to eat everything, anything before, because then it's just a slippery slope for the rest <laughs> of it. Um, so I go to my test kitchen and I, uh, around 11 o'clock in the morning, we start testing recipes. Um, every day? Every day, every day, five like days Like Monday a week, through Friday? Monday to Friday. Uh, and it, it's quite random, you know, we could be tasting anything at 11. And the funny thing is that I don't, I've, I've mentioned it maybe here last year, but it's, it's, I find it really phenomenal that everything tastes so good at 11 and so bad at 4. <laughs> <laughs> because we, these are the times. So if you're, it's the psychologically, it's really fascinating how much less delicious things are when you're full you're really yeah. I, I know chefs know that but I don't know that everybody knows that it's incredible your mind really plays tricks on you at four o'clock nothing tastes good really because you just can't put one more thing in your mouth 
So normally I leave or crawl out of this test kitchen at four o'clock, <laughs> and um, and then I go to the restaurants uh, for the before the evening service and t uh, talk to the chefs and the managers. So all the, of them you work through? No, no, no. I I would probably Just, go to one, okay, and uh, and then maybe after dinner I might go to another. It, it depends on the day. So this is really more or less what my average kind of day looks yeah. like. It's interesting. I want to talk a little bit about your earlier life. Um, you grew up in Jerusalem. Um, father's Italian. I didn't realize that. And I don't know why that explained something for me with your food when I read that not only did you get to be in Jerusalem, you actually got time in Italy as well. How important was that upbringing for what you're doing? I think it was very... My, my food cannot be further removed from my dad's Italian food because Italian food is all about restraint and minimalism, mostly in the north of Italy, which is where my father is from. And my Middle Eastern take is very busy and maximalist, and it, it doesn't do that very well. Although there is a recipe in this book for gnocchi alla romana, which is semolina dumplings. That's the first thing you've got to cook from the book. And my grandmother used to make those, my, my Italian grandmother. They're and, simple. They're quiet food. They're very quiet food, mm -hmm. but they're so good. It's all about the mm -hmm. cheese and the bit of nutmeg, and you cook your semolina, and then you spread it out, and you cut circles, and then you grill them with more cheese on top, and it's just so, so good. So this is kind of like the opposite of my normal cooking. Uh, but I think my dad and, and has, has been a real influence in the sense that there's always been great appreciation of food and great um, almost... Uh, veneration, you know, like the idea that things, meals are important, foods are important, and ingredients are super important, which is, I think, what which I got. Which is the Italian way. The Italian way, yeah. yeah. So the ingredients were really something we would understand, and, and my, my friends all used to make fun of me at school when I used to have, like, fresh basil in my sandwiches that I used to bring to school. We're talking about <laughs> at Jerusalem in the 1970s. They slapped some hummus inside some white bread and sent, sent the kids off to school. And I had, you know, basil, but, <laughs> and, but it's, it's just, you know, and you can make fun of it, but actually it's that kind of appreciation that I got through um, my family, which I, I appreciate now, because it, it gave me, I think, some kind of sens sensibility that, uh, that maybe others didn't. didn't but have. you weren't going to go into food. You were not destined to be a chef or to go down that path. You have No. So I, I, I went to university and studied um, philosophy and comparative literature. And I, uh, like a good Jewish boy, I finished my, my degrees. And I, because um, I, uh, even though I, halfway through my master's degree, I realized that I'm definitely not going to be an academic. I, well, I had an inkling. Uh, what I, was your thesis on? Oh, my thesis is so boring. <laughs> um, I thought it sounded interesting. It was um, the philosophy of the photographic image. Yeah. I thought it was, that made it, sense it, to it me. It was about representation in arts, in, in visual arts. And it was about photography. And it was about discussions about the, what is the relationship between um, a photograph and, it's the, or, or, and yeah. what is depicted in, in, in it. Um, but it, I, I think it is really boring. Not, not, not <laughs> so much boring. I think the, 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 when I finished my dissertation, I handed it over to my supervisor. I gave a couple of copies to friends and family, and I'm sure none of them has, has ever written it. And it is like the, like the, it's the extreme opposite to my cookbooks. You know, like so many people read them and cook for them, and that kind of. That, that crystallizes the, di the difference between the academic and You've academic. You've made every academic in this room miserable because they know <laughs> that's the truth. <laughs> um, it's 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 really it does make a massive difference. Into, if you're if you want a, a, a immediate gratification, you're not going to get it in university. Right. But, so I, I guess I'm one of those people. I just couldn't wait for to get you know the the um, the applause. That I never got. And you went off to culinary school then, right? And you were a pastry pastry chef, is where you went. I was went. a pastry chef. Yeah, that's how you started. I, my first job in the kitchen was in the pastry in the pastry department, and I um, my previous last time I was here was promoting a baking book, sweet, and um, and I, I still love baking, and that's what I did most of my times in the professional kitchen. I was a pastry mm -hmm. chef, and then I went to work in a in a bakery, and so I spent a lot of time doing that. I only started cooking um, savory food in a commercial kitchen when we opened Osolenghi, and I started getting 
into this world. And you opened with Sammy. With Sammy and Noam, who's another partner, and Cornelia, who's our fourth partner. We're four partners. In, and in Sammy, um, I've always loved the story of the two of you because he grew up in Jerusalem as well. Yeah. So Sammy... Um, Sammy a, Tamimi. Tamimi. He's a Palestinian from East Jerusalem. And I'm, um, I'm, I, I was from West Jerusalem, but we only met in London. Um, in Which our, seems perfect somehow. So yeah, well, I, it, you know what? There's much less pressure. Yeah. <laughs> so it's easier to form a relationship there, and it would have been much more difficult if we were back back home. So uh, yeah, so we started. We became very good friends, and then when um, when I wanted to open Ottolenghi, Sammy was kind of hesitant because he had a, a job so elsewhere, but. The very a couple of months before we were about to open, he, he decided to join, and um, that's actually why I, it's my name on the door, not his, because it was already in the making. Uh, but he's been a business partner and a creative partner since then, and, and, and he still is. And our, uh, we're very, very good friends. Yeah, you can tell. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, you are a relatively new father. You yeah. 2013, and you wrote very extensively about adopting, about, about having children as a gay. Yeah. Couple, why does why was it important for you to write about that? Um, so when my husband Carl and I wanted to have children, it, with the, the journey we had to take was quite a long one. We tried to co-parent with women, and that didn't work out uh, that very well for us because the relationships it couldn't carry two couples and one hypothetical child at the very early stages. So. Um, so we ended up um, having a surrogate actually in America, and uh, she um, she had both our both our boys, Max and Flynn. And for me to tell the story of the journey to parenthood was important for for one reason really. I didn't really think I should write this because I mm -hmm. didn't think it was relevant to anyone that if I've ha how I had my kids. But Carl was kind of insisting that I should tell the story because n not a lot of people had talked about the, yeah, that journey. True. And he said, you, you, you really need to tell it because I haven't read about it from anyone else. It, uh, that was five years ago when Max was born. So I've, I've written about it, a long piece in The Guardian mm -hmm. where I described the journey. And I thought, and, and I, since then, many people came to me and said, you know, that we were happy you, read, you wrote about it mm -hmm. because it was, it was something that we found inspiring. Also, in the, in back home in the UK, the, 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 the laws are a bit more difficult. They make having kids there more, mm -hmm. more complicated. So I, I was, it was, be, would be really important for me that the laws would change it and make it yeah. a little bit more d easier as it is in some states uh, in America like Massachusetts, where we had our kids. And how, how do you deal with being a public figure? Because you are a public figure now. And, you know, the idea that you would, you do have weight to write about something like that and have it really mean something. Um, what does that feel I, like for I, you? I, I don't know. I just don't feel like a public figure. I mean, I know you say that, but because um, I... I my life is just very small in some sense. When I go on book tour, of course, that's not the case. But when I, I'm not on book tour most of the time. So I, I don't really think like that so much sometimes. So, so I, I guess maybe I, I, I ignore it or, but it's all very rarely that I think I should, I need to say someone because I am a public figure. It's just not, it's just not something that I. Do you think. feel like you've done, um, made the changes as we, as your introduction that you have had. Do you feel the impact you have had on what we eat? Yes, because you really have. Yeah, I mean, I do, <laughs> I do have that feeling. I go to uh, shops or supermarkets and I see certain ingredients on the shelves, or even ways of displaying food in in, um, right. in restaurants and and um, in cafes. Uh, I, I do see. See that that makes me very happy and very proud. And the one thing that I really love is when I do book signings and people come and talk to me, uh, and they tell me certain things like a dish that I um, published in, in a book, and they say, "Well, that's our that's like features every week in our in our home." 
That's a great feeling. Yeah, it's hugely that's important. That's a really great feeling to know that you, because that's more, that's worth more than any article or book or anything. It, mm -hmm. It's there, you know, it's there and maybe it will be the case for another generation. So then you really feel like you've made a certain impact on what people cook. That's the best thing. Yeah, it's living. Food is living. Um, we're going to start taking questions if people want to come up. You want to come up? Yeah. Mr. Atalengi, thank you very much for your words, and thank you to both of you for a wonderful discussion. Um, um, Mr. Atalengi, I've read several of your books, and I found them to be very inter truly interesting and meaningful. Um, 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 one thing that I was wondering is, have you had the opportunity to speak about your books in Israel? And if so, how have, how, how have they been received there? Um, I haven't spoken tons about my books in Israel, and I always ask myself, uh, why is it that I don't I don't do that? But there's all sorts of reasons. I've, I don't think I've been asked to do it a lot, so many times. <laughs> so maybe, that could be an issue. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it was a little bit tricky at the beginning with Sammy and the relationship. I think it was it was quite difficult. I, I never wanted to do it on my own, and doing it together was not something that I thought was so forthcoming. Um, I don't have a clear answer. I know my, my, I, I, my, I have a series on television that has been um, broadcast in Israel. It's been very successful uh, over there. But um, yeah, I don't have a very good answer as to why not. Can I ask you, since you brought this up, so yeah. do you travel, you took Tony Bourdain there for one of his. What yeah. was that like? We, you know, traveling tra with, with, yeah, uh, with, with Tony. Tony and, it was incredible. I have to say that I remember it very, um, very. Um, and this was for his series, right? Yeah, for for uh, Tony's parts unknown. parts unknown on CNN, and uh, I took him around Jerusalem and showed him the city, and uh, we had a really good time. And but I only took him to one bit of the city, uh, of the country, and then when I watched the show, I was just so blown away by the amount of excellent work that they've done. Because um, people come to Israel and to Palestine and they have very particular experiences that are always kind of reliant on who tells them the story. Right. And because uh, the, these are just stories. And, um, and he just took nothing for granted. So I was just, so I told him my story and, other, and, I, and I was there with another couple that told him their story. But then I, 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 he went to Gaza and had dinner with a Palestinian family and then he went to the West Bank and went, he had a whole fr Saturday, Friday night dinner with a family of settlers and he really didn't take anything as a given and I was I think that is very typical to him you know to just kind of make you know every stone need not leave any stone unturned and really kind of mm -hmm. dig under the surface and see what's going on and I absolutely loved watching the show even more than than taking him around I mean which was a, an honor and a pleasure but yeah it was and I think this is I find it very sad the, the, the saddest thing about not having that show anymore is not having that perspective, which mm -hmm. is kind of an in-depth perspective and, and really trying to understand what makes a society what it is, mm -hmm. you know, beyond the food and the answers and the, narr the mm -hmm. kind of the official narratives. Right, because it's all related. You want to Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Thank you for continuing to visit us in D.C. So you've been here three times and I've now seen you three times. <laughs> My question has to do with how you feel about people commercializing your recipes. So I follow you on Instagram, and I know that you repost home cooks that use your recipes, the images. And I was surprised to see you repost an image of a bakery in the UK, I believe, um, that, that baked your vertical striped cake. Um, and sells it at their bakery. So I was curious how you feel about that. I didn't see that, but oh. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't noticed. But um, look, I see these things everywhere. I mean, this is a great compliment. I don't really mind that other people use I mean, everything you publish is, is public property, really. People can use it. Uh, whether for personal uses or commercial uses, it's really, I can't control it. And I remember conversations that we've had when I published my first book, which is 10 years ago now, the Autolenki Cookbook was the first to be published in the UK. 
And uh, I remember having these really serious discussions about how much we're going to reveal because of the, you know, like your secrets. And I think very early on we realized that it really doesn't make any sense to, to keep s things a secret. First of all, because uh, in our world it's very difficult to, to keep secrets, but also because it, uh, people would sense that you've kind of kept, held something back and not giving them what, you, what they wanted. And was that Sumac? <laughs> what that right? was missing. No, but I think really it is a kind of, for me, it's, there, is a, there is a contract that you sa sign with a reader if, you, if you're going to have a, 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 an honest relationship, and, and that is that you give everything that you can. I, I never held back, and I never held back within a recipe or just an actual recipe. I think it's really important to give, it, give every book everything you've got. Uh, and, I've, and that was always the, my, my policy. And if someone uses a cake in their bakery, it's, it's fine by me. Yeah. It's interesting, too, because recipes aren't... You can't copyright a recipe. What you copyright is the method. Yeah. That's what you can own. So it's super complicated and kind of crazy. Thanks so much for coming to speak with us. Um, I'm wondering if you talk a little bit about your creative process. You mentioned you spend your whole day in a test kitchen. Um, what does that process look like, and how has that developed over the course of your career? Um, it's true. So what I started just explaining is they used to test recipes on my own, and now it's a it's a group effort. I mean, it's really which is fun, which is have. fun, and but you know also there's a lot of myth about creativity, and I think the one thing. Um, I, I can reveal about my creative process is that it can take all kinds of sh shapes and forms. So sometimes um, I eat something um, in a restaurant or in someone's house or wherever. Just wherever not, I at <laughs> not at four o'clock. Not at four o'clock. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And I just love it, and I just want to recreate it, and it's absolutely fine. You know, it's like if I go to um, Vietnam and I have a particular kind of noodle soup. Just to give an example, I come home and I say, I'd love to recreate that process as close as possible to the, to the experience that I'd had. That is one way of, of creating a recipe. Another time, I it, it, that, that taste, that experience is just the beginning of something completely different. So it could also be a visual cue, you know, when I see something that just looks great and I don't even have any idea what it tastes like and that's where it kind of our world, our Instagram world that really helps because you see beautiful things, but you have no idea what they taste like. They could taste horrible. Um, and, and then you watch and say, visually, that's a wonderful cue. I'd love to take that visual cue and kind of implement it. And that starts a process as, as well. So it really is everything, everything is, is, has a different or, origin. I'm trying to think of a recipe in this book. Uh, oh yeah, there is a recipe for, for custard and with roasted rhubarbs and strawberries, which is one of my favorite favorite desserts in this book, and it's really easy to make. It just um, and I remember seeing um, so on on a website someone did a custard tart. <coughs> Excuse me, with strawberries and rhubarb, and the idea of of combining those flavors and the, those kind of the yellow versus the red was just so powerful that I thought I've got to go and try these combination. And it turned up into some. It turned into something completely different than what I'd seen. But everybody contributed something, and it ended up that that recipe. So, yeah, it's, it it goes in all sorts of ways. Thank you for joining us. Two things. First of all, I hope that you're going to consider opening a restaurant in the United States. <laughs> in Washington, D.C., for instance. <laughs> um, second of all, it, somewhat related to the previous gentleman's question, um, I'm curious to know, as somebody who is of uh, dual origins, Italian, Israeli, what are your thoughts on the concept of recipes needing to be authentic? Um, so I'm Cuban-American and you know, I make certain recipes, but I'll put a different spin on what my abuela cooked. And some people say, well, that's not authentic Cuban. But to me, cooking has always seemed to be developing, and especially in the Instagram world where you can cook something that was made in Vietnam or India. Yeah, I, I really changed my, or kind of, sh my opinion has really shifted. For a while, I was very protective of dishes, and I thought it was really... Um, it was, there was something kind of wrong to take a traditional dish of a certain culture and play around with it. And I, and I do remember getting slightly annoyed when I saw, I saw people doing 
things, and especially got annoyed when it's the food that I grew up eating. So, uh, someone called something a hummus, and it didn't even have a chickpea in it, and I go like, that is just totally <laughs> wrong. Um, but I have to say that over year, over the years, I've, just, I've kind of turned my opinion completely shifted to the other side. And I think it's very difficult in our world, or e even before our times, to keep things s solid and and um, and and. And one thing, you know, it's just if the, the, there is a tendency to, it's a human tendency to always want to play and experiment. And what we see as a as a as a cuisine is just a particular point in time where we decide to to look at it and give it names. And I'm much more uh, open now to all sorts of changes and getting. And I, I mean, it's very difficult because you're getting into questions of cultural appropriation, which is such a hot topic at the moment mm -hmm. in all fields, but also in the culinary yeah. field. And I just think um, I tend to gravitate towards the side that think that we should all be able to participate in the conversation. And as long as we don't hurt someone terribly, we can, we, we can all be playful about it. And I, and I know it's very difficult because if you, are, if you feel oppressed in some kind of way, then sometimes food is the only way to kind of keep your identity going. So you need to tread pretty carefully about it. But often I find people get really annoyed about certain things. Like I published a recipe for my take on an Irish stew a few years ago because my husband's Irish. And, um, How did and, that go? And um, I said, well, that's it. So I added some bit of orange zest and some par parsley or something. And I got these really angry comments at the bottom of my column with people saying, that is not an Irish stew. The Irish stew is just mutton and water. And I go like, oh my God. So what am I going to do now? Because in a sense, like, you know, then the people that were enraged were not even Irish. <laughs> so, you know, it's very easy to take it to, the, to an extreme. And I often find these days uh, that people do take it to the extreme. I think we should be a little bit more lighthearted about it unless someone's um, livelihood or identity is really about to be crushed. And that was not, that's not the case 90% of the time. Then I think playfulness is a better policy, really. Do you have a cuisine you're really interested in digging into right now? Or are you fascinated by something? Um, so I, I always go to Asia because I find Asian cooking really kind of echoes the Middle East, but in all sorts of interesting ways. So I've, I've, I love Malaysian cooking. Malaysia is a country I traveled in and explored its, full, its food a little bit, and it's, it keeps on giving because it's so rich, you know, Indian. Layered. Malay. Really, it's full of layers. You know, it's got three main cultures, Indian, Malay, and Chinese. Mm -hmm. uh, but the combination of what happens when these color cultures meet is really fascinating. It's very complicated cooking. It's the opposite of simple because the process that leads to a, a, a good um, soup, one of these fantastic noodle soup with all sorts of names that they right. got there is really incredible. But, but I love that cuisine. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty amazing. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I was wondering, you've really championed the use of vegetables throughout your entire career. And I know it's probably a hard question, but what would be your sort of top three that you keep coming back to over and over again that you find, you think you've exhausted all the possibilities and then you find another new thing? So glad you said top three and not the one favorite. <laughs> well, you I know, was expecting I'm an you to say what's your so favorite I have vegetable. To be generous, I can't yeah. you just this one. <laughs> um, thank you. I mean, f f it really does changes. You know, the vegetables that I love cooking with. But recently, I've had a love affair with um, what you call zucchini, what we call courgettes, and it's funny. It's a vegetable that I never really had that strong relationship with for many years and I just I've been spending some times in Greece over the summer over the last few years we go as a family to Greece and um, and there's very li if you're on an island there's not that much you can get and courgettes or right. zucchinis are one of those things that you get all the time zucchinis tomatoes eggplants and that's about it the only vegetables you can get and they are just so wonderful. So I've got quite a few recipes in this book where they're served raw, raw or crushed or grilled or, or steamed. And they're just a wonderful vegetable. And they, the nice thing about it, they're quite subtle. But that subtlety allows you to do a lot of things with other ingredients. So that's the top vegetable at the moment. The other one is cauliflower, which is just the most fantastic vegetable. Again, there's quite a few recipes in the book. And often I say, 
uh, you know, that you can actually create a whole meal almost just based on ca cauliflower from fritters to soups to salads. It's, it's a wonderful veg. Um, and then the third one, I guess that would have to be the tomato because it's just such a great, uh, it's great. It's, it serves everything really. You can, so those are the three that I, I cook, cook the most, but I'll come next, come back next year. I'll have another three. What, what's Listen. the new, what do you think the new it vegetable is going to be? The new it vegetable. Yeah, because so really, cauliflower is waning. Yeah, Bru so Brussels sprouts, Brussels sprouts are, are like done. No, I think it's going to be. Um, oh, I forget the American. Name. We call it Swede. What do you call it? Rutabaga. 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 I Swedes, love rutabaga. The Swedes and parsnips and uh, yeah. the turnips. The all the the old school um, root vegetables that nobody really loves so much. Hey, okay, you heard it here first. It's rutabaga. <laughs> <laughs> They're gonna come. Here to go. Hi, thank you first for um, teaching me what Nigella seed is and uh, your cauliflower cake recipe. Um, but I was wondering, you've been to DC a couple of times. Where do you like to go to eat or where do you want to go? In, in this DC, distance? yeah. Oh, do you know what? I've got the... I'm, I, there's not many reasons why you should be feeling sorry for me, but there is one reason why you should be <laughs> feeling sorry for me. Because I go all over the world and wherever I go, I eat, I eat my own food. Because I, there's all sorts of events where, you know, yep. you cook your own food. So I don't really go out as much. So last year, I had a really incredible experience in, in here um, when I went to Rose. Rose's Luxury. It's Luxury. Because I called it something else. No. Yeah, it's Rose's Luxury. I called it something. What did I call it before? What did Campus she call it? Rose. Maybe it was Campus Impression. Rose. Yeah. yeah. Rose, Rose's right. Luxury. Right. And that right. was a really fantastic meal. It was worthwhile queuing for. I queued for three hours. Uh, from from three thirty, there really is no and, reservation there, right? <laughs> and, and it's it's the first time I've heard someone would talk, told me about like these queuing mules that you have here, so you can get someone else to queue for you. But I just couldn't bring myself yeah. to do that. So yeah. Helen and I just sat, and we had the most fantastic meal. And I remember there was something with coconut that just kind of disappeared, and it was just phenomenal. So that would be the one. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I just want to say what an honor it is. And I have every one of your books. Um, it, they do resonate with me because I'm of Indian descent, but I'm married to a Palestinian. Um, so your stable, your pantry, ingredients are what I have at home. So I love the way you kind of meld all of that together because that's what I'm constantly trying to do. Uh, get my kids to eat Indian food with a Palestinian twist or Palestinian food with an Indian twist. Um, added to that, I'm also a culinary major. I went to culinary school, so I, um, so I really know how to cook. I mean, not, not in your league, but I do. <laughs> but I do have one question for you. The one thing I have found over the years, people are intimidated. Nobody invites me to their house because they yep. can cook at all. And I was curious whether you experienced the same. <laughs> I don't have that problem. <laughs> um, so maybe being a you get invited for dinner. I get invited for dinner because I'm a very I'm I really actually really I I'm not critical uh, of other people's cooking. I just appreciate it so much when someone invites me for dinner. I love it, and I'm actually I, I can enjoy any kind of food really, uh, and I, I'm so for me it's like when I. T um, test the recipe for the restaurant or for my books, then this, the bar is much higher and I kind of put myself in a different position. But normally when I go to people's home, I'm just happy to be fed. Well, this, I would say the same for myself, but I don't get invited. It so hoping you maybe you look it. scary or something. You come with, maybe, you, maybe, you, maybe, maybe, I'm going to tell them. She with, does not look scary, no, I have no, to say. She arrives scary, like... <laughs> Okay, I'm glad so. I'm, I'm going to tell them if you're something get invited, I think you can invite me. Too. <laughs> <laughs> just you. tell them you love everything. You'll think you'll be all right. Okay, and just one more note. Since you said you love roses, love three, and you like queuing up, um, I had the honor of going to Himitsu. If you ever get a chance to go there. What's it called? Himitsu. 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 It's another one where you queue up, and the food is spectacular. Oh, okay. Spectacular. We have an owner up there. No, I'm not. <laughs> 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 Hi. Um, I also have a question about uh, dinner parties. You mentioned before um, that when you're hosting a dinner party, you should go to uh, making items that you're really familiar with and love to make. So when um, I get an invitation to your dinner party, what will you be making? <laughs> uh, um, well, I, I love to 
do them. When I cook for, di for friends over, I, I want to get everything out of the way before they arrive. So I, I prepare things in advance. So I will give you, so one of the things that I love, I love making is um, b the big platters of, of vegetables that we, that we have in our shops because it's effective, it's beautiful, and people enjoy it and they can choose things. So and you bring I, it home from the shop? Well, I do that often, yes. I do, I do that when I, need that when I don't have time. But uh, what I, I think it's really effective to, rather than sit each, give each person a, a plate, is to present things like that. So I always have, one thing that I would always mostly have on my dinner table is one take, what, some kind of take on the jadra, which is rice with lentils and fried onion. Because this is like the holy trinity of deliciousness. It's mm -hmm. so good. Uh, so there will be something like that. Then there will be some kind of a really nice um, stew. And one of the ones that I do a, lo a lot um, since I've been testing this book is, is, a, is a lamb sinea. It's a lamb stew with a crust of tahini on top that kind of bubbles away. So it's like the equivalent of a, of, um, a, a shepherd's pie, but it's got a kind of a lamb crust, a, a tahini crust that's really nice. And then lots of roasted vegetables of all sorts of, um, in all sorts of ways, configurations. So that would be my my spread when people come over. Nice. I'll be on the lookout. Yeah. <laughs> so um, my wife and I had a chance to eat at Nopi. It was sort of like a religious experience for me. Um, but what struck me was every moment was warm. Beyond the excellent food was the really warm service, the conversation. Somebody brought me the spices to look at and smell. And I just wonder nice. how you accomplished that kind of, it's like you're in somebody's house wow. in a restaurant. I Will you explain what Nopi is? For people yeah, who, Nopi yeah. is the restaurant, um, one of my restaurants, our restaurants, and it's in, in central London, just off Piccadilly um, Circus. And um, I, first of all, thank you, because I, I didn't know we provide such good service. <laughs> we do. And, um, and I think, well, I don't have a really good explanation, apart from the, probably the fact that, um, so we are four partners in the company, and I mentioned, um, Sammy has been mentioned because he's on the books, but there's two other people, and one of them is Cornelia, who is our general manager, and she's a, she's a, a service person, through and through, and she's incredible. The, the, the thing, she works a lot with the teams on creating, uh, sort of giving, giving with the service what we give with the food, which is that kind of sense of generosity. And, and um, I, I can only give her credit. I mean, we tried to create a, I mean, although there's quite a few restaurants now, uh, we, we run a, a big company, relatively. Uh, it's, we still try to keep that kind of family um, atmosphere. And one of the things that really helps, I have to say, is our customers, and I'm not just saying it because there's potential customers in the room. <laughs> I'm saying it because uh, people come to London from all over the world to eat in, in our restaurants, and I never take it for granted. It's a really, it's a wonderful thing that, we, that uh, there's Europeans and Americans and Australians in the room. You just hear all these accents and languages. And I think people that come especially to eat in a restaurant from another country, they, are, they want to be part of an experience, so they talk. And, they, and, and I think it catches on to the waiters. And, and so that, I think that's probably part of it. Because it's like an occasion to come to Nopi for, for many of, the, of our guests. That's Thank lovely. You. Thank you. So we have time for two more questions. Do you want me to um, take them in order? Speaking Piggybacking on that, I went to Nopi for my boyfriend's birthday in oh, May, see. so that was an occasion, and the bathroom is incredible. Wow. <laughs> if you guys have been, it's beautiful. You have to go. Um, I don't we know if you would agree, but... We like those good bathrooms. <laughs> um, so my question is, so we're talking a lot about how you cook for your personal life, dinner parties, and you know your staples for your family, and you cook for your work, obviously, and where do you draw the line between work and and personal cooking and you know we're talking about your, your recipe books you want to share yourself with the world you know how do you feel about about that and like do you ever want to keep anything secret not just like you know withholding sumac from a recipe but you know really like keeping something just for you and your family like where does that line it's very draw? difficult it's a very difficult question and it's a very difficult line to draw so I think I tried I imagined in the past that you can do things uh, that I can kind of create a certain degree of separation be between 
and you know how I cook at home and what we eat at home and but I find myself so totally immersed in my work that when I come home from work everything is kind of shaped by mm -hmm. what I cook I can't think of cooking or, or or trying something that is not kind of immediately related to what's been happening one of the things that I do a lot recently for the boys is 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 uh, thin pan crepes, thin, uh, pink, uh, thin pancakes, and crepes were in the sweet cookbook. And I remember when I was here with Helen this time last year. And Who was Helen, the co-author on that? Helen book. Go, she's my co-author in Sweden. And Helen said, "I, we know what I do for the boys. I make a whole lot of crepes and I freeze them and then I serve them." And that was a recipe in the book. So any anything that we do just immediately informs. So there's, I, well, the short answer is, I guess there's there's very little pri private life when it comes to the color, to the world of food in my life. Everything is kind of wide open now. I've okay. I've given all my secrets. Well, about. we appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. One more question. Thank you. Very honored to have the last question. Appreciate it. And thank you for being here. Uh, one of the things that I love most uh, about your recipes um, is something that I've been happy to see has been touched upon a lot tonight, that it seems to be this beautiful combination of the very diverse places that you've lived or experienced in your life. Um, and so I'm curious uh, how that how honoring your roots has really influenced the way you select recipes for your restaurants and your books. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think what I've, I was, the, the point that I was trying to make on a couple of occasions is that what started off as something that was very private in my, uh, was recipes that were really kind of much more based on where I started has become much more of a communal effort. So this book has got two more people who are two, two women that are co-authors and everything is personal but also but it's personal to other not only to me but to other people and it's very interesting what happens when you take something which is very personal to one and kind of share it with the others and everybody can comment it becomes it's not mm -hmm. private anymore so Esme Howarth who is it was was one of the authors of the book. She worked on, as a chef on a bo on boats on yachts for years, like ten years. She was chef, she was a chef on yachts, and many of her recipes are really go back to the time on boats when they used to stop somewhere in the med and get ingredients and cook. And it's a whole different frame of mind of cooking. You know, it needs to be very practical. It needs to be very solid. It needs to be, you need to anchor things on counters <laughs> so they don't move. I mean, we don't do this in this book, but it, it just informs the whole way you cook. So she brought out, she, you know, the, she, there's a couple of recipes for jacket potatoes in this, in this book, and nobody could believe that an Ottolenghi cookbook would have a recipe for a jacket potato, but that's just the thing she, she used to serve a lot. So it's, but then we had to kind of change it, and then um, one of the recipes has got a tonato sauce, which is, um, some of you may have, we know it, it's a, it's a kind of anchovy-based sauce that is served in, in German-speaking country, northern Italy, with veal. And it's, I love it. It's some uh, capers and it's, it's like a mayonnaise. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I, so that was completely not related to jacket potato, but I thought like that would be the, that would be the, um, the twist, mm -hmm. right? It's such a wonderful sauce. So what started off with something which is completely from one world ended up having something from another world. So those hybrids are very much what this book is about. Thank you, Mr. Odalenghi, for you, all you have done to change our culinary life.